welcome to Ready Camera One. I'm your host, Lauren Kindler, and today I am joined by Andrew Onesti, a martial arts enthusiast. Hi, Andrew. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for joining us today. You know, I'm the, the uh, thanks. I, I, it's a huge honor to be here. You know, I love talking about martial arts. I practice martial arts every day, either with people or by myself. So the, the fact that I get to talk to someone about it for I think as long as I want is, is a huge honor. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what first got you into martial arts? What first got me into martial arts? I mean, I think as a kid, like everyone, you know, watches their, their heroes on TV and it's like sees them fight and thinks, oh, that's cool. Um, so like that obviously, you know, comics and video games were just made fighting look cool. And so that got me into it. And also my, uh, my father, he did, I think he did Kempo when he was younger, and so he had his, his martial arts gi. I don't know if you know what that is. It's like the karate suit mm -hmm. that people wear with the belt. He had that hanging up in his closet, and I'd be like, oh, Dad, what's that? And he's like, that's, I did karate, son. And I was like, I want to do that. And he'd show me stuff, too, when I was a kid. So I, I, I got interested in it at a, at a really young age. Um, and then I did a little bit of wrestling in middle school, um, but it really wasn't until I hit high school that I, you know, actually started taking it seriously. I, uh, I went to American Karate Studios mm -hmm. in Boardman, uh, which is a Kempo karate school. They have other stuff there too, like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and some Kung Fu that I did. Um, but I did that for like three, four years. Sorry, I, I would overlap training. So I would do mm -hmm. like karate. And then eventually I did karate and kung fu at the same time. Karate would break off. And then I would do two other things at the same time. But that's what got, that's what got me into it. I didn't start actually doing uh, uh, like more modern stuff, combat sports side of things until late high school, early college. So I had more of a traditional um, experience in my earlier days that led up to more modern, what you would say like, you know, boxing, wrestling, Muay Thai. And that's like mainly what I do now. But I've had traditional experience of Kung Fu and Karate stuff too. Very, very interesting. So what education and training with self-defense as well as martial arts do you have? Well, as I said, I started off, um, other than like dabbling as a kid in like uh, some, some sports, uh, I, did karate, Kempo karate for four years. I competed. Um, they do, I mainly did kumite. There's there's katas and like self defenses and weapons and stuff they can also com compete in. But I, what I was mainly interested in was the kumite side of things. And that was sparring, fighting. Um, in karate, kumite is called, it's basically referred to as point sparring. So it isn't full contact. You kind of just uh, you kind of see who can touch the other person first and then you score a point. And I it's, think it's different competition to competition, but you score so many points, you win the match, and then, you know, you go and you, you can do, end up doing a lot of matches that way, actually, since you're not actually blasting each other uh, in the head. But I did that for a bit. Um, then I got into Jeet Kune Do, which is a type of Kung Fu. Uh, Bruce Lee actually made it. Um, so that was cool. That kind of opened my eyes a little bit, not because Jeet Kune Do was anything amazing or anything like that, but the, the philosophy of it was uh, you should try everything. You should take what works for you and really not worry about if something's not working for you. You shouldn't force something that isn't working for you to work. You know? So like, the philosophy side of it really made me want to explore a, as many martial arts as possible. So once I started doing that, um, I pretty, like, Pretty soon after that, like uh, through my high school, I signed up to compete in a boxing event. Um, I, uh, I won one fight, got absolutely dominated in my other fight. And so uh, that was also a huge turning point. I was like, this is a lot different than sparring karate style. <laughs> um, but I, I, like, I fell in love with it. I nosedived into that side of things. Um, like I said, there was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu school that also uh, had a space at the karate studio. So I started hanging out with some students from there and they taught me some Brazilian Jiu Jitsu stuff. They would uh, 
actually meet up at a children's Taekwondo place that my little brother went to. And I started talking to him by picking up and dropping off my little brother to go to Taekwondo classes. And he was like, yeah, we, we roll, uh, you know, here, uh, you know, at this time and on these nights. And I was like, can I come? He's like, yeah, sure. So I kind of had like a little bit of a free like jujitsu education going into it by these like, like really high level dudes. But I, I think that's like the best way to learn is by having someone who's a lot better than you show you stuff or even kind of uh, go a little bit harder on you. So I did that, went off to college. Um, I wanted to start my own club, essentially. I was like, you know, I'm, I would say I'm like really about martial arts now, but like back then, that was like my entire, my entire life. That was like my identity, basically. Um, so I wanted to start a Jeet Kune Do club and then just do stuff with people I wanted. I was looking for clubs through Kent State and I couldn't find something that really was for me. So I'm like, I'll just start my own. That's for me. And that's how I eventually met the Golden Gloves Boxing Club at Kent State. I started working with those guys um, and there I ended up basically just, I didn't have many people in my club. It, it was me and my friends getting together essentially. So uh, I eventually worked with the boxing club and, you know, got really, really deep into that side of things, um, competed a bit more. Eventually, I became the president of the boxing club, and I was uh, basically, uh, I've been teaching people throughout my uh, college career the past six years. I've been teaching people the fundamentals of fighting. Um, and yeah, I've also had, you know, some kind of like accessory training. Um, there was... Like, I worked with a lot of ex-police officers, so I've had some kind of, uh, like, specialized weapons training, uh, working with, uh, like, knives and firearms. Um, th th those guys, they're really serious about it. I'm more about having fun, but, um, you know, so I've worked with, you know, realistic kind of weapons. I, I, love, I love fancy traditional weapons, too, like the bow staff and the nunchuck, you know, stuff like that. Th those are really fun to use, but I've... Uh, Back when I was like really into like, I need to learn how to fight. I was like, I was doing more uh, modern weapons. So I've, you know, I have my, uh, I have my concealed carry. And now I train in, I train in firearms. Uh, I don't do as much knife stuff anymore, just because. Uh, at least you know, you and I, we don't really live in an area of the world or a time where we really need to be worried about someone coming up to us and shaking us a bunch of times, you know, maybe other people mm -hmm. in other places, that is a very real possibility and a serious thing they need to be worried about. But for you and me, it's like, I, ju I just kind of want to have fun. I don't, I don't want to be paranoid and training my knife defenses, you know, every day. That's, that's not something I really need to do. But that's my experience. I competed in Naga wrestling tournaments. Um, haven't placed top three yet in any. Um, so I haven't been doing too good. I'm definitely more of a striker than a grappler, mm -hmm. uh, but I love jujitsu. So um, what do you think um, is a reason why people should not go to self-defense classes? The main, some of the main reasons why people shouldn't go to self-defense classes is because whatever, whatever you're going there for, like, like why, why do you think someone would want to go to a self-defense class? To protect themselves. To learn how to protect themselves. Maybe to be stronger? Maybe to be stronger. Like, th that's the two main things. You go to self-defense because, like, maybe you're worried that you're not able to defend yourself, right? Um, what you'll get in most self-defense classes, there are places, I should preface this before I just start dogging on self-defense stuff, that some schools and some places are really, really good. They teach good stuff and they, they get the bigger picture, um, but they are few and far between. A lot of places, uh, they would just, they want your money. The stuff they show you can really give you false confidence and maybe even like the wrong answers to certain situations. Um, so if, if like me and you went to like a self-defense class, like the, the first one we, we found, there is a pretty good chance that the instructor there would like immediately have us doing some sort of uh if like having no weapons like some sort of combination 
working on it. Maybe we would uh, go over like a weapons thing, like like what to do if someone tries to like come at you with a knife or this, or maybe they even like would be like, what if multiple attackers come at you? That's none of that training is necessarily bad, but all that training needs a foundation. It needs a foundation of basics that you usually get through combat sports. You need to be able to know how to move your feet around. You know, you need to be able to move uh, efficiently and consistently while fighting. You need to be able to know how to throw a popper punch. You need to know how to breathe, you know, when you're in that stressful situation. So a lot of that you get from like sparring and combat sports and just, you know, drilling what uh, a boxer or a kickboxer or a wrestler would do. And then like, you know, you have your accessory training on top of that, which would be like, okay, like someone's stabbing me with a knife. I mean, here's some stuff we could do. If someone's coming at you with a knife, you need a good wrestling foundation before we just can learn what to do, you know, with a knife. So that's a big problem is that people don't build that foundation before going to these classes and they get, at least I'm worried that they get it in their head that they know what to do or that they're more capable than what they really are in those situations. Um, a big thing is like, you know, also we can't, we can't simulate realism to the extent to how, how it actually feel. You know, us, you know, getting a fake knife out and working on some stuff will feel a lot, lot different and realistically just be different than if you were actually attacked by someone, you know, with, with any kind of weapon. Um, there are some things you can do to make it more realistic. Unfortunately, you need money uh, to make things more realistic. Like I said, there are certain schools. Um, Endeavor Fitness in Columbus, um, like, you know, they have a Krav Maga school, but they also, they, they teach their fundamentals. They have BJJ classes, um, grappling classes. They do Muay Thai and kickboxing on top of their, like, self-defense focused stuff. Um, but, yeah, it's... You, you could buy better equipment to make it more realistic. There's these cool little training knives that kind of act between like a fake plastic one and a taser. So it kind of like shocks you uh, when you like press a button on it. And I actually had the, the opportunity to like feel what that would feel like. I went to the, actually the KSU uh, community policing uh, program or the police experience, I think is what they call it. They had one of those there and I was like, hey, can you, use that on me and it was nuts it felt like he actually cut me but oh he didn't. wow yeah it was, it was it was pretty cool well but those things cost like 200 dollars. i appreciate you diving deep into martial arts and um, i appreciate you coming today um, so thank you for that uh, but can you show us a little bit yeah i can i can show you some stuff let's uh let's right. uh go do some stuff okay. welcome back now andrew will show us a little bit of their martial arts experience Thanks, Lauren. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is that there are a few basic ranges, uh, not including, you know, projectile weapons. So first range that we usually have to think about is the, the empty one, where we can't really touch each other no matter <laughs> how hard we, we try to reach. The next thing that could, uh, uh, you know, work is our legs. Our legs are our longest limb, so us doing stuff. You know, I may not be able to touch him with my hands, but my feet can still touch him. And then we got our hand ranges. And you might be noticing that the adjustment between these ranges is really small. It's very, it's very finite. And after we got our punching range, we got our grappling range, where we can't really punch each other. We, we still can punch each other, but mainly what we're going to be doing here is, is grappling, our grappling range, where we try to go for, for tight stuff. <laughs> so, um, fundamentally, what are we looking to do between all of these ranges? Defense. Um, main part of defense is our movement. So, whenever we're in any kind of fight, combat sports or uh, self-defense, street-oriented, um, we don't just want to stand still and wait for the other guy to do stuff. We want to move around. We want to keep them guessing, maybe use feints and footwork, you know, whatever. Um, actual things besides that, besides moving, using your head and stuff, uh, uh, let's say like blocking a kick. 
the norm most normal kick, and actually most used kick you probably see, is the roundhouse kick. It looks like that. What Jared just did is called a check. That's actually how you properly block a kick. He uses his shin bone, he turns and faces it. Ideally, he wants to block using his knee. That's how you see those nasty injuries. Well, guys will throw a kick, they'll block it, and their bone will snap. That's what they're doing. They check the kick. If it goes higher, he can just touch guard or use his arms, the frame. If I throw a high kick, yeah. So if he threw a high kick to me, I don't want to try to push away too much because if I push away too much and I miss, I'm going to get hit. So blocking a kick, super cool. Checks, keeping hands high and tight, palms out, A-frame, cool. Punch wise, again, your first defense is movement, not being there, making him whiff and miss. Other than that, it's going to be not just putting your hands up. A lot of people think, you know, oh, I know how to block a punch. I just put my hands up and that's it. You need to also tuck your chin because that's going to be the thing that really hurts you is if they hit you on the chin and your elbows are in and tight and I'm literally like scrunching up. So when he throws punches, it has a good base. If I'm loose, you know, he throws punches, I'm going to smack myself in the head or stuff's going to slip through. Now, wrestling, when we get past the punching range and into here, defense, it's, it's going to not look as obvious as when like proper defense works for striking. For wrestling, stand up wise, it's all about your base. You want to have a strong base, wide legs. You want to be lower than your opponent's hips. So when Jared's like really tall, super easy for a smaller person to get their hips lower. The reason why we want that because it creates kind of a shelf for me to lift Jared up. You know, if I take a big penetrating step and do something called a double leg, you know, that's why I want to be lower than him. Other than that, you know, when you're wrestling, you know, strength is really uh, needed to be successful in these. So you can use your head, you know, you can use your hips too as a supplement. So yeah. Thank you, Andrew, for being our guest today on our show. This has been an absolute pleasure to talking to you and finding out more about what you do. I'd also like to give a big thanks to all the viewers watching Ready Camera One. Uh, this is your host, Lauren Kindler, and we'll see you next time.